introducing our speaker today. We've been friends for well over three decades. Uh, Bill Sheffield uh, did his PhD at McGill University. He postdoc at McMaster University, and he is now professor of pathology and molecular medicine at McMaster University. He is the associate director of research in medical affairs and innovations division at Canadian Blood Services. And in that capacity, he is the uh, person who is my administrative supervisor at Canadian Blood Services. So I guess I can't say anything too nasty about him today, right, Bill? Uh, he uh, we all, we all he has to... been my... He has been my friend and colleague and collaborator for all these years. I'm thrilled that you're giving a talk. I am not thrilled you are not here, but you'll make up for that in the near future, I'm sure. So, Bill, we uh, look uh, forward to hearing about what you have to say about most models of hemorrhagic shock. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Ed. And uh, apologies that uh, I'm not... Uh, present in person. Uh, it, this sounded like a very rational thing to do, not go to Vancouver until uh, I connected today and I started uh, hearing familiar voices and uh, friends and colleagues. And now I'm a bit regretful, but uh, at any rate, thank you for that kind invitation. It is true that theoretically Ed reports to me, but we all know that scientists don't really view themselves as any as reporting to anyone except for perhaps Darwin, as Dr. Scott would say. So. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, take you through some results from my lab. Um, those of you who have CBS affiliations, you might recognize the talk. I, I gave it internally in April, but since then it has, the work has gone through the rigors of peer review and it has been, uh, it has been improved in the process. Bill, yep. Bill, I'm just gonna interrupt. I'm not sure if other people are having difficulty hearing. Maybe you could move your microphone closer to your, Okay, um, thanks Ed, let me work on that. And can we can we increase the volume here as well? Mira? Thank you. Sorry for that interruption. I think this, uh... Okay, is that better? That's much better, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I, uh, <laughs> I've got this headset and I pride myself on using a headset since we all went virtual and it was actually not connected. So I was uh, talk thinking I was speaking into the headset and inadvertently just using the microphone on my computer. So sorry about that. So today I'm going to um, uh, update you on some results in my lab done in collaboration with, uh, with Ed's lab at CBR and uh, in which we tried to, we tried various transfusion or infusion strategies, transfusion of uh, blood products in a, and infusion of other substances in a mouse model of hemorrhagic shock. And should have tested the uh, ability to change slides. Huh. So that's really weird. Uh, can give me a minute can we do something for you, Bill? Uh, I'm not sure if, um, unless Parvin has control and I don't. Yeah, Sorry, she might. Don't have it. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And uh, let's share again. Okay, uh, hang on. Okay, now I see my slides advancing. Do you see them advancing? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I think we're ready to go. Okay, let's move away from the title slide before I use up all my time. <laughs> 
Um, so today I'd like to tell you about what I've learned and what we've learned in my lab uh, and in the literature about trauma, coagulopathy, and blood product transfusion. Uh, to do this, we've, uh, we've borrowed from uh, previous investigators the way that we always do, and we've adapted a pre-existing mouse model of hemorrhagic shock. Uh, we've added uh, a readout for hemostatic uh, competency or, uh, or restoration of hemostasis, uh, namely liver laceration. And we've added different interventions to the model originally described by Cheeseboro in 2009. We've tried various resuscitation fluids um, to alleviate the hemorrhagic shock. That's relatively easy. You just give back the volume that you removed and you can restore the blood pressure in these anesthetized mice. Uh, but restoring the ability to withstand a hemostatic challenge, like plunging a, a, a scalpel through the liver of the anesthetized mouse, that's a different story. And we, we tried a variety of fluids, saline, plasma, um, uh, plasma protein products, other colloids, I'll tell you about that in detail. So some of these were successful in restoring hemostasis, but for reasons that I'll elaborate on, we wanted to not only restore hemostasis, but also eliminate coagulopathy, which is a dysfunction in the coagulation system that you would think is related to the ability to control bleeding or not. We th I'll then show you ELISA results that we did, somewhat of a survey to try to understand what else was going on and to perhaps uh, provide mechanistic explanations. I'll uh, talk about the work that was done in Ed's lab by St Scott Meissner, uh, involving an analysis of cytokines and an in-depth uh, look at fibrinolysis in these in um, plasma samples from these mice, at which the Prysdale lab is expert. To share some conclusions and future experiments. So. I want to talk about uh, persons with trauma-induced coagulopathy. And although I'm not a big baseball fan, basketball was always uh, more of my uh, jam, as the young people would say. Um, I do think of these patients as, as, as starting their treatment or their attempt to recover from injury with two strikes against them. So the first strike against them is trauma. And physical trauma, as I'm sure we all know, uh, is physical injury resulting in wounds, broken bones, internal organ damage. It is a serious and critical injury. Trauma is the fourth leading cause of death in cancer. Uh, I think the most recent statistics I found were from 2020. And uh, fortunately, the COVID situation has improved because uh, trauma came in after uh, COVID-19, after heart disease, after cancer. Um, and so among trauma victims, uh, a variety of expert opinions suggest that, that gaining control over bleeding might be one way to avoid preventable death. And uh, we do know that trauma patients need extensive transfusion support. And we also, studies have also demonstrated that around a third of trauma patients arrive at trauma centers with trauma-induced coagulopathy, also called acute traumatic coagulopathy. And these patients have a particularly poor prognosis among a group that has, is already in serious trouble. So the second strike, uh, the way I like to describe it in TIC, is coagulopathy. So uh, they've arrived with trauma. They often have ongoing uh, bleeding, potentially life-threatening, and they also have coagulopathy. So this is dysfunctional coagulation. It's, um, it's not defined uh, clinically by most investigators, but is instead defined by lab val values. So if you see an elevation in the prothrombin time, or the, uh, often reported as the international normalized uh, ratio, the activated partial uh, thromboplastin time, APTT, or in viscoelastic measures, uh, such as uh, those parameters obtained from TEG or ROTEM uh, systems, then uh, there you can, <clears throat> then you've met the definition for coagulopathy. And you, you might say, well, this is not terribly surprising. Uh, patients have lost blood, they've lost plasma, they've lost platelets. Uh, all the coagulation factors are in, are in the plasma and the plates, of, of course, play a critical role in hemostasis. Um, so this isn't terribly surprising, but this is not a simple consequence of blood loss. And there's uh, clinical data to support that statement, both from the um, civilian and uh, military setting 
um, both retrospective studies such as those done by Brohe uh, in the UK uh, in about 20 years ago now, suggesting that, uh, there, that about a quarter of air transported trauma patients arrived at trauma centers in a coagulopathic state. And Holcomb in the, um, from the US in the military setting found that over 40% of um, trauma patients were coagulopathic in a prospective uh, analysis a trial with the uh, acronym of PROMPT. So um, the impact on blood transfusion services, and as I pointed out, I'm a part of Canadian Blood Services, and uh, uh, we have um, competitive grant support to investigate this. So we want to, we want to look at um, issues that are important to transfusion services. Um, the critically injured patients uh, require a lot of attention. They require a lot of blood products. Often there is little time to type blood type them uh, or to um, um, order blood products in a leisurely fashion. And this has led to the rise of massive transfusion protocols. So an MTP involves an early identification of massively bleeding patients, perhaps uh, while they're in transport to the, uh, to the trauma center and having um, uh, trauma packs ready. So, um, ready to go, uh, universal red cells, uh, platelets, and pre-thawed plasma. And then the plasma case, the ideal uh, mass uh, transfusion protocol plasma is AB negative uh, that can be uh, given to any recipient. Um, so that's at the hospital level. Now at the pre-hospital level, um, there's a possibility that plasma transfusion might be beneficial uh, to um, uh, trauma uh, victims, uh, trauma patients who are in, tra in transport. And this possibility is, um, is suggested by, <laughs> by three clinical trials, or, or maybe it, it isn't. And, you, and you'll see what I mean about that conflicting statement as we go through them. So since 2018, there have been a number of randomized uh, clinical trials of different size and different design, trying to, to get at an answer to the question of whether pre-hospital plasma transfusion is beneficial in trauma patients. So the first one on the top, which I've cleverly depicted using uh, a picture of an ambulance, because this involved only ground transport to a single center in Denver, Colorado. It was called COMBAT. It uh, randomized patients to receive plasma or saline. Um, there were about 150 patients. I think uh, 140, 150 were intended and 145 were, um, were um, enrolled uh, before the trial was stopped for futility. There was no difference in the uh, primary principal outcome of 30-day mortality uh, noted between the two arms. So in the same year, the findings of the COMPAT trial were contradicted by PAMPER, which was pre-hospital air medical plasma trial. Uh, this enrolled more patients. It was a multi-center trial, including one center in Canada, the, uh, the trauma center at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. And uh, patients were randomized to receive either plasma or crystalloid, so that's typically normal saline, or it could be uh, something like uh, Ringer's lactate, a, a, a pH balanced uh, um, saline type solution. So they either receive plasma or, or crystalloid during air tra transport. There were about 500 patients, and there was a really impressive improvement in 30 day mortality for the plasma group from uh, mortality of about uh, 33% in the control arm crystalloid, a reduction of about 10% down to 20, 23% uh, overall for that primary outcome. So when we just had combat and pamper to look at, people weighed in, tried to analyze. They said, well, some people said, some uh, analysts said, well, you know, combat is superior because the randomization was, uh, was, was not done in blocks and pamper is inferior because the randomization was done, you know, a, a particular uh, loc uh, uh, tr transport service or hospital service would, would be assigned only plasma or only crystalloid, e even though um, 
even though they were blinded uh, to the, the nature of the transport. So this is known as a block uh, randomization and it's uh, methodological purists don't find it, uh, find it to be uh, potentially not as good as other means of randomization. So there were fights going on, but um, uh, in terms of the interpretation of these trials, but a meta-analysis uh, combining, um, combining both trials uh, was published uh, using appropriate methodology, which, in, which reinforced that finding. Now, more recently, we've had the refill trial. Um, this is uh, a multi-site trial uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, it stands for resuscitation with blood products or with pre-hospital blood products. And uh, they had to take quite a walk to turn, to, uh, turn that into a, the, a pronounceable acro acronym of refill, but they managed it. And in, in the refill trial, um, patients who are transported to trauma centers in the United Kingdom, uh, either by uh, air or by ground, um, were treated with cycles of red blood cell concentrates followed by freeze-dried plasma. And uh, the red cells were administered first in the cycles. That's on one arm of the trial. And in the other arm, saline was administered. So there were 432 patients. Uh, there was no difference found in the composite outcome, which was a combination of 30-day mortality and a failure to clear lactate. So um, what does this mean? We, we, it, it, it's really hard to say. And I think the jury is still out as to what is the best pre-hospital uh, treatment fluid. From an economic point of view, uh, the investigators in refill said that they couldn't endorse the expense of pre-hospital uh, red cell um, and plasma administration compared to the relatively inexpensive alternative of saline when they saw no benefit. Now, some analysts have pointed out that the, 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 um, the mortality or the composite endpoint in refill was higher than anywhere else at 60%. And other potential confounders is that patients in both arms received um, tranexamic acid uh, as a fibrinolysis inhibitor, which has been shown in a, another randomized clinical trial to be of benefit in trauma patients. So where does that leave us? It leaves us, I think, although I'm, I'm not a clinician and some clinicians would disagree, perhaps in a bit of equi equipoise about whether um, the benefit of plasma transfusion. So we thought that we would try and contribute to this in an animal model where we could, of course, it's a, a less uh, clinically relevant, but in wh where we could control different variables and test different hypotheses and, and hope to, to add to the overall understanding in the area. So one of the first things that we did was to, um, and I see my slide seems a little bit off in terms of one of, of the image, but it doesn't matter, uh, was to do a systematic review. And we actually started this uh, during the uh, 2020 lockdown period um, when my lab, like all of your labs, was briefly closed for a number of months. And then as soon as the lab opened, like good experimentalists, we dropped this project like a hot rock until I said to Antje, ask, you know, we really should complete that systematic review and put it into the literature before um, the work that we did on it is without value. So we did that last year. Um, and the reason that I'm mentioning it is just to say that while many investigators have tried to use different animal models to contribute knowledge in the area of uh, trauma-related coagulopathy and hemorrhagic shock, there's no consensus as to what the best model is or which model best fits uh, the clinical uh, exigencies. So when we surveyed the literature and we were updating previous um, um, systematic reviews, we, um, we updated the literature to the end of 2021. We found pig, rat, monkey, rabbit, mouse, sheep, and dog studies. And, um, and uh, one of the mouse studies was from our lab. So that gives me a segue into looking at our previous work and then introducing you to our current model of hemorrhagic shock. So in our previous work, uh, which we called the, blood, the BECA model or uh, blood exchange induced coagulopathy approach, I, I had to, I, I criticized some of the clinical trialists for their acronyms, but I had to take a pretty long walk to uh, make an acronym out of this too. And this was done in collaboration with, um, with Ed Prysdale and Hei Yu Ni. Um, we took a reduction appro reductionist approach to try and investigate uh, 
whether plasma was useful in coagulopathy. And right from the beginning, we said, we're not going to try and mimic a clinical situation. We're going to try and take a reduction ap reductionist approach and create a coagulopathy um, or at least a plasma protein deficiency without creating a, a concomitant anemia or thrombocytopenia. So we did that by doing blood exchange. We did a four fourfold exchange of whole blood for washed red cells, uh, which were, um, and because of the very high platelet count that we start off with, um, this uh, led to only a mild thrombocytopenia, only a mild anemia because um, we'd replaced much of the uh, whole blood with, uh, with packed red cells. And we dropped all plasma proteins by a factor of, of four. So for, um, uh, <clears throat> so this gave us a normal blood volume. So we didn't have to worry about, uh, about shock or about uh, resuscitation. Um, we, there was some trauma involved uh, in, in this model. And uh, we said, okay, we've created a coagulopathy. What, what does that uh, entail? And sure enough, it entailed uh, an increased uh, bleeding tendency on hemostatic challenges like uh, tail transection, liver laceration, or a laser injury. And we found that we could overcome the coagulopathy um, and the excess bleeding with, uh, with plasma, with plasma uh, uh, protein products, specifically with um, uh, a, a a blood product or a plasma protein product called a pro prothrombin complex concentrate, which is a combination of the uh, vitamin K dependent factors. There's uh, uh, factors uh, seven, nine, 10, prothrombin, protein C and protein S. Um, and so we published those findings and, and I felt pretty good that we'd made a reductionist model, but we kept on having the very appropriate criticism that our model uh, was not clinically relevant. And eventually we decided that we should, uh, although we thought we'd learned some things and manipulated the system, that we, could, we could not overcome that criticism if we wanted to continue working in the area. So we, uh, we created or we modernized a model first described by Cheesebro in uh, 2009 in a publication in Shock. So those, these investigators used, uh, they anesthetized their mice, they um, uh, inflicted the trauma of laparotomy. In other words, they made an abdominal incision exposing the ad abdominal cavity. Um, they used um, um, a controlled hemorrhage. So they measured the arterial pressure and they removed, reduced the blood volume until they uh, dropped it down to a target of 35 millimeters of uh, mercury. They left the animals in shock. Well, actually, they showed the, sewed the animals back up and uh, left them in a shock period um, before doing some investigations, but no interventions. And I knew that we were going to have trouble uh, getting uh, animal research ethics approval a decade la later for this model. So we modified it. We maintained uh, anesthetic coverage for the whole uh, investigational time period. We substituted the trauma of incision specifically in the neck area. We removed tissue and skin in order to uh, gain access to the carotid artery for cannulation. Um, we also made incisions in the, the leg area in order to uh, place the pressure probe at the femoral artery. And we said, okay, we're going to uh, induce shock following Cheeseborough's approach for a period of uh, as long as we can, or ideally 60 minutes, which is clinically relevant. And then we're going to fluid resuscitate. And I had learned years ago in a project with my colleague, Alison Fox Robichaud, who's an internist at McMaster, that fluid resuscitation in this context means giving fluid treatment so that you bring the blood pressure uh, up to normal. So what we did was to combine fluid resuscitation um, with um, we used fluids which we we hypothesized would have some hemostatic benefit as well, and right. so so having done that, we then um, we then said, okay, have we actually restored hemostasis? So we lacerated the liver and collected the shed blood as a measure of hemostasis. We were able to compare with sham mice uh, who received who had no hemorrhage, no fluid, 
um, but they had everything else done the same in the manipulations, including the trauma of the neck area excision and the leg incisions. In the image that you can see next to a, a standard um, ballpoint pen is the, is the pressure probe. It's exceptionally small. And uh, I'm in awe of the talented uh, research assistant in my group, Louise Eltringham Smith, who was able to develop this model and routinely uh, use it uh, with uh, such uh, small instrumentation. To the right, you see the, uh, the pressure probe readout showing the reduction of, uh, of pressure during the uh, controlled hemorrhage period and uh, an artist's impression of our liver laceration model. So um, initially, uh, so there was a, an ongoing dialogue between myself and Louise when we were um, trying to adapt this model. And it went something like this. Here's you know, Bill. Hey, Louise, how about you try this intervention? Louise, Bill, the mice will not survive that. Bill, oh, okay, well, how about this? So, so we had this uh, model development and we thought we had a, a good protocol. Um, and, but it, because of these concerns, we varied the shock time. And we found that, uh, as you can see in panel A, the, the mice uh, responded, uh, we were able to, um, to extend the shock time from our initial cautious five minutes through 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And then having uh, found that at 60 minutes, the mice survived, um, we, um, we fixed uh, the time period at 60 minutes for all future experiments. In, in these initial experiments, we looked at, uh, um, <clears throat> we compared blood loss when we resuscitate with saline to when we use mouse plasma shown here as mouse FFP or fresh frozen plasma, because that's, that's how we store it after we collect it from a pool of donor mice. Um, and uh, we could see a clear difference in, uh, in blood loss or restoration of hemostasis when we, uh, when we use plasma transfusion or plasma resuscitation compared to saline. And uh, similarly, we saw that with saline treatment, we had a coagulopathy after, um, after fluid resuscitation. And, um, and, our, and our protocol in each, uh, each of these time periods, we had uh, a significantly elevated prothrombin time compared to, um, compared to initial values when we resuscitate with saline, but uh, this coagulopathy was eliminated when we used plasma. The mean arterial pressure uh, between the two groups didn't uh, differ significantly. Uh, neither did the volume of blood removed, which was around 700 microliters in both cases. And importantly, um, you, know, you, you could look at our, the results that I presented you so far and say, well, you know, Sheffield, you're just looking at a dilutional coagulopathy because uh, of what happens with saline. Now, I would challenge you that it's hard to say there's a dilutional coagulopathy when we use the same volume of plasma and do not see uh, um, and don't see coagulopathy after the intervention time. But nevertheless, um, in order to get at this, we did an additional experiment where uh, we collected blood with as little manipulation of, as possible via cardiac puncture of anesthetized mice and we compared it to our sham treated animals. So here we were asking the question, um, has, um, has the trauma that of neck uh, area uh, ec tissue excision, has that, ha is that associated with a coagulopathy? And the answer was yes, because we saw a significant increase in prothrombin time um, when we compared sham to control animals. So um, we now surveyed a lot of other treatments and I've grouped them over on the side. Uh, in each case, we're looking at uh, the blood loss. Uh, so we, uh, we collect the blood um, with, um, af after doing the liver laceration because, because of the nature of the liver, we can kind of uh, mobilize it a bit and get a teared weigh boat underneath it and physically weigh the blood loss. Um, so under sham conditions, we, we lose less than 100 milligrams of blood, or the mice do. Um, this, we see um, an increase. We see a, a bleeding tendency when we resuscitate with saline, but that bleeding tendency was eliminated um, by uh, treatment with, um, with murine plasma. And it didn't matter whether we aged it five days in the refrigerator. Um, so the, 
it doesn't seem that the uh, labile uh, factors were critically involved. We didn't get this effect when we use 5% human albumin solution, which is a colloid uh, resuscitation fluid that has no coagulation uh, related activity. Um, speaking of coagulation related activity, we found that we could uh, control the bleeding or eliminate the bleeding tendency using uh, fibrinogen concentrates, but we had to go to a really high concentration. Um, in contrast with PCCs or the prothrombin complex concentrates, we were able to restore hemostasis uh, with both a clinically, one of the clinical doses that is used to reverse warfarin so and, um, or for a somewhat lesser dose. You know, in the literature, there've been some suggestion that providing PI-1 might be effective uh, as an inhibitor of activation of, of fibrinolysis. Uh, we didn't find that but we were able to find benefit for uh, tranexamic acid at, uh, at either of uh, two somewhat disparate doses that we found in the literature in rabbit models. And then finally, we, um, uh, we tried a DNA aptamer with the uh, somewhat prosaic name of HSO252G. And this is an aptamer that inhibits activated protein C. And we saw that this agent was effective. So a number of our interventions restored hemostasis, um, but uh, I haven't shown you the coagulopathy data yet. And in addition, um, when we put this together for peer review, we got an admittedly good question asked, which is why did you group them and why did you repeat the presentation? And this, my somewhat inadequate answer was I thought it would be easier to understand the data, but I do understand that there was the perception that we, by grouping, we might have introduced some, some bias. So we redid the analysis. Um, <laughs> okay, now I'm going to sound off a little bit because we also, now, you know, in animal studies, it's, it's hard to generate the massive numbers that are occasion that are somewhat, um, that can be the feature of clinical research. And I don't know whether any of you have had this criticism, but, um, you know, typically we try to, uh, we try to have at least uh, N of six so that we can do statistical tests of normality and to assess whether the standard deviation of our test groups is similar. And if it is, we can use parametric tests. And if it isn't, we have to use non-parametric tests. But I encountered peer reviewers who said that if N equals 10, you can't use um, parametric statistical tests. We will only accept non-parametric statistical tests. And also don't do that nasty grouping thing that you did. So the long and the short of it is if, if the same, same data that I showed you on the previous slide, if you, if you redo the, the data, you don't change the conclusions or the statistical significance, uh, although the magnitude of the p-value is not as good, or not as impressive as it previously was. So, um, so we've, as I mentioned, we, we uh, saw that um, both plasma and some plasma protein products uh, interventions were effective. And a, a little bit more about that HSO252G. So we did not discover this compound. We found it in the literature. My original intention was to use a recombinant antitrypsin described by Jim Huntington's group, which is uh, um, by mutation, they turned it into a a pan-specific inhibitor of various activated uh, coagulation factors and serine proteases into a specific inhibitor of activated protein C. Um, but we were trying to make the protein ourselves uh, in E. coli and we couldn't get enough protein. Um, and my graduate student at the time, Mustafa Hamada said, oh, I've seen this paper in the literature about a DNA aptamer that's a high affinity specific inhibitor of activated protein C. So uh, we used this publicly available information, made the, um, made the aptamer, and tested it out. And the first thing we did was to, um, um, so activated protein C, and, and I realize this is one of the few talks where I haven't shown a coagulation cascade. Um, so, um, but I did put in a little graphic uh, reminding those of you who don't work in this area every day, that um, protein C is, is a uh, vitamin K dependent uh, plasma protein. And uh, when it, it can be activated by uh, a thrombin bound to thrombomodulin um, specifically to become an activated uh, factor, which is anticoagulant because it acts um, 
it, it performs specific proteolysis on activated factor five and activated factor eight to inactivate those cofactors. So APC has a, um, an anticoagulant effect. And so we, we did the, we reproduced the findings of uh, Muller et al. And um, uh, showed that um, in, in a APC dependent uh, assay um, involving the prolongation of the APTT, we could reverse that, um, that um, APC dependent activity with this aptamer. And when we used uh, a, an oligonucleotide or a, another piece of, of synthetic DNA of the same length, uh, but different sequence, we didn't get that effect. So what about coagulopathy? So um, when we surveyed, uh, so you'll remember, I, I, we, I shared with you that we'd found that, that plasma, PCC, um, and a, a variety of, um, of agents, um, plasma, PCC, and the anti-APC aptamer, um, they eliminated the uh, bleeding tendency, but what about coagulopathy? So some, some agents did both, some agents did only one. But we focused our, act, our attentions on uh, plasma, uh, PCC, uh, and the anti-APC aptamer because they could control both, um, both aspects of trauma-induced coagulopathy, both the uh, elevated bleeding tendency and the coagulopathy. Um, so that was uh, satisfying in that we'd done a survey and we wanted to find some age to distinguish between effective and ineffective agents in our model. Um, what uh, mechanisms could contribute to these findings? Well, a large number of mechanisms have been suggested to contribute to uh, trauma-induced coagulopathy. And they range from endothelial damage, uh, also called endotheliopathy, um, uh, by some of its proponents, um, the indirect effects of a cytokine storm. Uh, there's the promotion of anticoagulation through the, uh, um, uh, through the APC pathway. Uh, some investigators have suggested that hyperfibrinolysis is the problem, such, such, such that uh, clots can form, but they have no staying power and no ability to uh, stem blood loss because they are... Um, uh, pathologic subjected to uh, pathologically accelerated fibrinolysis. And of course, there, there's also the possibility that um, with some of the massive insults that are going on in this, uh, in the uh, critically injured patients and the animals we're using to model them, there could be clotting factor depletion, uh, that simply the clotting factors are depleted because of their consumption uh, in generating clots and that perhaps that contributes to the, to the syndrome. So in order to address this, we, we looked at APC levels and you can see that in, uh, in panel A. So um, in our, with saline resuscitation, uh, we see about uh, an eight to 10 fold elevation in APC levels, which is consistent with, with what was originally reported by, um, uh, by Cheeseboro in the initial uh, model and is also a similar elevation uh, seen uh, clinically um, by subsequent investigators. We could eliminate that, although, um, or eliminate a statistically significant difference when we treated with uh, plasma and um, also with the anti-APC aptamer um, as shown in panel A. So we also, so that seemed to suggest that there was at least some involvement of the APC pathway in our model and in, uh, in our um, successful interventions. We also, uh, we next look at tissue uh, plasminogen activator and not a lot is going on here. We did notice a small um, but significant reduction in, um, in our saline uh, treated group that was not seen in either the um, uh, plasma treated or aptamer treated groups. And, and um, initially we didn't make much of this, but our peer reviewers um, suggested that we were actually seeing something uh, going on. So we, we modified our, uh, our discussion of that, but, but really the, the changes are, are very uh, small and don't correlate uh, to the extent that the APC changes. We saw very little uh, happening with PI-1. Uh, nor did we find it effective as an intervention. 
Um, D-dimer, which is a marker of ongoing activation of coagulation and fibrinolysis, was elevated um, as, which is not terribly surprising given the, given the injury and hemorrhage and all of the pathophysiological insults that we inflicted on the anesthetized mice, of course, with uh, animal research ethics approval. Um, but there may have been some minor amelioration, uh, really hard to say in terms of D-dimer. And Syndican 1, which is a marker of endothelial activation or dysfunction, we saw an elevation uh, in Syndican 1, essentially no matter what we did, um, suggesting that there's some impact on the endothelium. But notably, we didn't find that any of our treatments that correlated with controlling bleeding and uh, eliminating coagulopathy, they had no effect. So it was hard to draw a direct line between uh, endotheliopathy and um, um, modifiable changes in the model. Uh, with respect to hyperfibrinolysis, I've already mentioned to you that uh, we, there was no excess TPA or reduced PI-1 um, in, in those direct ELISA measurements and no effect of PI-1 when, when we used uh, elevated amounts of it as an intervention. Um, so we conferred with, with Ed and uh, Ed and Scott uh, started doing fibrinolysis experiments and they, they did uh, excellent work, made valiant efforts, did things that baffled me like taking the second derivative of the slope and in essence, they reproduced our findings uh, with respect to the TPA and PI-1 ELISAs and the, and the, or at least supported it in that they didn't find any uh, suggestion of hyperfibrinolysis and they didn't really find any um, logically connected effect of our interventions. Um, so we don't see hyperfibrinolysis unlike some investigators in primate models. Um, also, uh, con uh, contribute, uh, also, the Price of the Lab contributed a cytokine analysis on uh, array technology, uh, looking at a very large number. You get 40 cytokines and growth factors using an R&D systems bioarray. And I remember um, Scott doing a lot of work to, um, to be able to quantify the, the spot type analysis that is the readout from these uh, investigations. And, I can summarize a lot of data by saying that we saw elevations in cytokines and inflammatory cytokines consistent with what others had seen in models, but we didn't see any pattern of um, uh, return to baseline when we with interventions that were effective in affecting bleeding and coagulopathy. So, um, before I pass to on to confusion, uh, confusion to conclusions. <laughs> That's a Freudian slip that I haven't made before, but it amuses me. I hope it also amuses you. Before I pass to our conclusions, um, I'd like to point out that our model has some limitations. So when we, um, by combining uh, fluid resuscitation and treatment, um, we're using quite a large volume. So if the, the mouse has um, so if we removed about 0.7 mils um, and then restored that, let's say with plasma, that means we were giving a dose of 0.7 mils of plasma, that's 28 mils per kilogram. And a clinical dose of plasma is more like 10 to 15 uh, mils per kilogram. So we thought about this and we thought that we would get um, uh, this criticism because our initial uh, submission of the paper was to transfusion. Um, we got all kinds of different criticisms at transfusion and rejection of our work, but we didn't get this one. But nevertheless, I think it was a relevant experiment. So what we did was we said, okay, we're going to resuscitate with a clinically relevant dose of plasma. Um, we'll use saline. Uh, we'll, so we'll use combined saline and plasma resuscitation so that we restore the blood pressure to its initial levels. Uh, but we've, uh, we've used the more appropriate amount of plasma and we still managed to significantly reduce the blood loss. Um, but the coagulopathy remained, although we did manage to ameliorate the activated protein C. So we wondered whether perhaps this uh, gives some insight into why the findings with plasma are less impressive or less consistent clinically, because it's just not possible to um, uh, 
to give enough um, functional, whatever is functioning in the plasma, it's not possible to give enough of it with this relatively dilute biological uh, fluid. So anyway, we, um, we as, as I said, we, uh, uh, we didn't fare well at transfusion, but we fought the good fight at scientific reports through uh, two rounds of, uh, of revisions and a total of 30, let me think about this, 32 specific points from uh, the anonymous uh, colleague who shall be known as evil peer reviewer number one. Uh, and we ended up in the literature uh, about eight days ago in uh, scientific reports. So um, before I move to conclusions, I'll just share with you some thoughts. Um, I, I always think the simplest explanation is, is that the same thing is going on uh, or the same mechanism is uh, explain, can explain results. So, so <laughs> although I have way less hair than uh, Dr. Einstein, uh, I think of this as trying to come up with a unified field theory or, or, less, uh, or less importantly or less uh, um, globally to try and um, unify our, our observations. So we found that PCC was effective in both modalities, coagulopathy and bleeding control. We found that plasma was, and we found that anti-APC was. And we thought, what do these three things have in common? And we thought, well, anti-APC optimer, all it does is inhibit APC. Uh, plasma contains inhibitors of, um, of APC. Um, mouse plasma, a um, human plasma contains two. Mouse plasma contains one main one, which is the most abundant serpent, serpent alpha-1 antitrypsin. And all that we needed was to make this grand theory work was to find um, an, uh, an APC inhibitor in PCC, but we can't find one. There's no um, detectable, uh, if there is any uh, antitrypsin, it's below the level of detection. So we kind of reluctantly say that um, we, our results cannot be explained by one mechanism, but perhaps TIC itself uh, it arises from a combination of different mechanism in this complex pathophysiological situation. So in future experiments, we want to explore AAT levels and AAT APC complexes. Um, I'm, I'm still holding on to the possibility that that might explain some of the benefit of plasma, but my uh, theories have often been uh, counter contradicted by data. So we'll see if that happens again. Um, we were interested in doing a dose response for HSO252G, and we're wondering if we could use it in a prophylactic manner, in a preventative manner, the way that um, Joseph et al. in a paper uh, published in Blood, I think, I think that reference is wrong. Actually, the, that was the ASH abstract, uh, Blood 2019. The actual paper came out in 2022. And these investigators made a hardened form of uh, factor five, um, which in activated form could not be inactivated by APC. And they found that they could uh, prevent or reduce TIC by pre-administration. And at first I thought that's like, when are you gonna know that you're gonna be involved in trauma? But these authors suggested it might be useful for military use. And then I went, oh, of course, uh, in the military setting, people know they're going to be at risk at certain times. Whereas in the civilian uh, setting, none of us set off uh, for work in the morning thinking that we're going to be involved in a traffic accident. We also would like to understand if uh, we can get better results with other treatments, including resilient treatments. So what do I mean by that? Well, we'd, we'd like to uh, introduce platelets into our investigation so we can compare uh, platelet-rich plasma, for instance, or freeze-dried platelet-rich plasma. And uh, we can do the same thing with plasma and freeze-dried plasma. This is uh, work in our new grant uh, in which we're working in collaboration with my colleague at McMaster, Dr. Isaac Nazi, who is a platelet expert. And we have some, a little bit of new data over on the right-hand side that I'll leave you with, um, where you'll see the familiar sham and, and saline comparison in our model um, and uh, amelioration of, uh, of uh, bleeding or blood loss by both um, um, frozen plasma and freeze-dried plasma, or uh, freshly made PRP or its freeze-dried equivalent. So um, I'm almost done. I'm a little bit, I've left a little bit of time for questions, not as much as I intended. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Uh, I need to acknowledge funding from the CBS Intramural Research Grant Program from 2019 uh, to 2022 um, to myself and Ed as co-investigators. Uh, experiments were done by Louise Eltringham Smith, uh, and I've I don't have enough pictures of my lab group over the last few years uh, for, I guess, for pandemic reasons. But Louise is on the right-hand end of that somewhat uh, of that group in 2016, and more recently uh, in full pandemic year uh, with Antia, who did our, um, who led our systematic review. Scott in Ed's lab did all that work on cytokine analysis and fibrinolysis. Ed is my colleague and co-investigator. And I would be happy to stop sharing my screen and take any questions that you have. Thank, thank you very much, Bill, for that great talk. And I'd like to remind people who are watching online to raise your hand and uh, if you wish to ask questions and Parvin will direct me to you. Dr. Conway has a question. So Bill, great talk. Um, that's a really a tour de force. Sorry, I'm having trouble. It may be Ed. You could repeat. Should I start again? Yes. Uh, well, I, I heard that. I heard the tour de force bit. That was nice. You don't need to replay. Repeat that. Okay, then I won't. <laughs> No, you stole my thunder in comparing um, in the comparison between you and Einstein. I was going to say the same thing about the hair. Um, that's the only difference I noted. Um, so my my question: um, you made a comment about Syndicate One um, being persistently elevated, no. uh, if I've got it right, um, and um, I wasn't surprised at that. Um, I would have expected in a, such a short term. Um, traumatic injury model. I mean, if it reflects glycocalyx, endothelial glycocalyx damage, I'm not sure how you would recover, you know, get it to recover so quickly, um, which raises the question then, it, um, I would have also been surprised if you got total, total, total recovery from such a model, um, any kind of trauma model. Uh, wouldn't you think that we do have to target the glycocalyx in some manner, um, given that that's probably a component of this um, injury, tra trauma, um, endotheliopathy? Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I, I didn't mean to um, uh, suggest there was no contribution of uh, the endothelium, obviously with the, um, you know, the interactions in the protein C system and thrombomodulin, and also, perhaps we picked the wrong model, but we did that in reaction to what was in the literature uh, in, um, in experiments um, from Dr. Patty and her collaborators, where um, they were essentially pointing to Syndican 1 and other changes uh, as being causative. And so we're not saying they're not happening. All we're saying is they don't correlate with the short-term amelioration of bleeding control and uh, of coagulopathy that we noted. Doesn't mean they're not, I mean, I, like, unlike, I, well, actually, no, Einstein didn't have a unified field theory. Just like Einstein, I can't, I can't unify our observations by saying clearly there's only one thing going on. I think it's more likely that multiple things are going on, but modifying some of them might be more uh, effective than others. And of course, in the longer term, these pay, you know, it's not as if, so, so we only look uh, for 60 minutes. It's been argued the first 60 minutes or the golden hour is the most important in critical injury. But of course, um, you know, it's 30 day mortality that is more meaningful uh, and, and relevant. And of course, um, down the road, um, there's a lot going on here. And the endothelium, like all other systems, is going to have to return to baseline or um, there won't be good outcomes. Madeline. Thank you for your talk. I just had a quick question about what you touched on in the end there with the platelets. With your model, have you measured platelet functionality in there or is it like future experiments? We have not. Um, yeah, great, great question. It's future experiments. It's different experiments. We um, we're somewhat limited in in when we can sample and how much we can sample. And so 
we, we've made certain choices. Others would have focused on on different um, different aspects. And of course, we I think we've we haven't addressed the platelets much because um, that's not my forte and it's not the first thing that I thought of. But we will be trying to address that. And and as you've correctly pointed out, we're we're going to do other in vitro analyses of our uh, of our platelet containing interventions. Uh, in collaboration with Dr. Nazi to, to see what's going on, in particular to see what kind of platelet microparticles we might have before and after lyophilization. Jay, you were really next, but I defer to our student first. That's nice. Uh, Bill, uh, Jay here. Um, the question regarding the model, um, in, in, in trauma patients, uh, there is an increased levels of uh, nets, neutrophil extracellular traps, as well as DNA present in plasma of these patients. As reading some of the literature on that, how, in, in your model, have you looked at any of those, um, you know, presence of DNA or you know, increased levels of nets in the in the plasma? Uh, we have not, but an excellent suggestion. Um... So I'm trying to think about what I know about nets and plasma. I realize my co my colleague Patricia Liao has been active in a um, a clinical study uh, looking at cell free DNA and prognosis. And cell free DNA is not a good sign for uh, in sepsis. I'm not sure whether cell free DNA has been implicated this early in trauma, but um, it sounds like you're aware of a study in which that is the case. So. We'll have to put that on the list. <clears throat> you know, my first love is to make what um, a former uh, student called Franken proteins, recombinant proteins that are fusion proteins and variant proteins. And we've done that, but we've also become interested in these more complex pathophysiological settings. And uh, uh, some days I long for the simplicity of change the protein at this residue, see what happens to it afterwards. Anybody online, Parvin? Uh, Bill, I'm I'm thinking, and I, you know, I was so excited about your Optimer ex experiment and the success with that APC inactivation. And we're always thinking about the effects of APC and inactivation of five and eight. But I'm wondering about its inactivation with protease activated receptor one mediate activation of a variety of cells, which I don't recall anyone really investigating in the literature. Now I'm thinking that that could open up a, a wide range of functions, not only with, in terms of endothelial cells, but also in terms of leukocytes. Now we could start looking in that direction as well. We could. <laughs> you, you're, you're adding to my uh, pathophysiological fatigue. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? I see Bill? Cedric has his Cedric has his hand oh. up. Uh, at, go ahead then, Cedric. Thank you. Yeah, I guess one thing: your your mice are anesthetized. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so one of the things in sort of Cinderella of hemostasis is vascular contractility. Uh, I don't know if this is a, anything worth looking at, or even how to look at it. It's always been there in certain models, but uh, no one's done much with it. Hmm. Well, thank you, Cedric. Um, yeah. You see, in your hemorrhage model, you see it could it could, it could be one of the determinants. You know, putting the plasma proteins to one side. Yeah. Right. So, are you suggesting that we need non anesthetic periods of of uh, when the mice are not under anesthetic cover? I, I also don't know how you get around this this problem, but uh, you know, vascular contraction is one of the primary things in hemostasis. Because we can't measure it very easily, we tend not to, we tend not to look. <laughs> right. Oh, excellent point. And. Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned in the earlier models, um, there, are, uh, there are periods where the mice are allowed to recover from anesthesia, but I know from, um, you know, from, my, from the, uh, the ordeal of renewing our animal utilization protocol every four years that the, uh, the veterinary authorities have become less and less uh, um, enamored of anything involving not uh, not having anesthetic cover. The other thing I was noticing, I was looking at the paper by BC Joseph et al. in uh, in Blood in 2022, where they used the Super Factor 5A, and in their model, um, they do they remove 
75% of a liver lobe in anesthetized mice. And then they sew them back up and they let them wander around. And then they anesthetize them again in order to measure the blood loss using indwelling um, um, filter papers that they inserted during the surgery. And I looked at that and I thought, how did they get that by their animal research ethics board? Um, but perhaps uh, there, are, there are many ways to vary the model and uh, we'll think about doing that in the future. Yes. Um, quick question here. Um, you mentioned that uh, you were unable to do recombinant alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, with E. coli, but that was something you were to trying to do. Have you tried a human antitrypsin or at least um, try to, to see your hypothesis of APC being the main target? Oh, um, I think I may have uh, inadvertently uh, been unclear. Those are two different things. So initially we wanted a reagent that would be specific um, to inhibit activated protein C. And we had read in the literature about an antitrypsin. We work with antitrypsin in other um, uh, work in my lab, recombinant antitrypsin. And we wanted one that the Huntington group had described. It's called KRK antitrypsin because in a critical surface loop, they had modified um, a P, a proline arginine serine uh, tripeptide to lysine, arginine lysine, and they found that that conferred specificity for APC. But we had trouble making the doses. You need about 15 mg per kilogram of this, uh, this recombinant protein. We had trouble making that, and that's why we went to the APC um, aptamer. Now, moving to the second part of your question, uh, it is so antitrypsin is, is a poor inhibitor in kinetic terms of activated protein C. However, you can, you can overcome its relatively slow rate of inhibition by concentration if there's enough of it. And mouse plasma has, um, has about double the amount of, um, of antitrypsin as human plasma does. And that means that takes it from about 20 micromolar up to about 40 micromolar. So, that's, so there's different kinds of antitrypsin that I was talking about in different parts of the presentation. I hope that clears that up. Yes, thank you. Any more questions here or out there? Well, Bill, thank you so much for an informative and an entertaining talk. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Hopefully next time I'll be in Vancouver. That'll be our pleasure.